Christians believe that we are called to a life of holy living that is marked by an act of God cleansing our hearts from original sin and filling us with love for God and humankind. This experience is marked by complete dedication of the believer to do God's will and is followed by a life seeking to serve him through service to others. <laughs> In Bangladesh, Nathan Biswas saw the devastating poverty that crippled his nation. I'm a village boy. i grown up in a village. But God gave me a vision. God gave me a dream uh, to work among the poor. By helping families start their own businesses, he is improving his homeland. But he is also expressing his love for God by demonstrating love for his brothers and sisters in the impoverished villages of his country. These are individual women mostly uh, that work together. It's always one person uh, that receives a credit and two others that sign together with her that guarantee the amount together with that person. And uh, <clears throat> these people uh, then return the money, of course, after some time. They actually pay back in store by installments. I think we have a great uh, opportunity. I have a big hope that if we can continue this, with our ideals and uh, true uh, Christian uh, spirit, I think we can uh, achieve a lot. When I was walking on the village and see the poor and I smell, I feel that people have a big, big desire to come out from the bondage and uh, uh, transfer their life and the darkness to the, uh, to the light. In the Church of the Nazarene, like Nathan, our response to God's grace becomes our mission. Because God's love has been extended to us, our answer to his love, a life of worship. To become fully devoted disciples of Christ, we embrace the spiritual discipline, fellowship, and accountability of a local congregation. It's with a local body of believers that we are nurtured and grow in our own knowledge and understanding of his gifts of love, purity, power and compassion. Worship really is, is responding to God. Uh, one definition that I like to use is giving God, returning back to God the best that he has given us. And that uh, when we're in church, it could be prayer, it is our singing, it is our quoting scripture. Sometimes it's our being silent. It's responding back to Him. The beginning of our thanksgiving and, and praise, it is exuberant and it is fun. But when we come into His presence, when we are in His presence, that is what the worship is. The thanksgiving and praise, I, I believe, usher us into His presence. And when we find ourselves in His presence, then we are worshiping. There are Sundays that I walk in as a worship leader, I don't feel like worshiping. And uh, I think the psalmist felt that same way at times because uh, in one of his psalms he said, I will recite everything good that I know about you. And I think at those times we make a decision, today I'm going to recite everything good that I know about you. And to me an amazing thing happens when we do that. Things start changing within us until we come and it, even that action without even feeling it will help bring us into his presence. That's why it's so important to come through the gate of thanksgiving and then enter in through a spirit of praise. That's how we come into God's presence. When we respond to him, it's not just in song. We respond with everything that we are, with, the, with, with our lives uh, when we walk out the door. Thank you for loving and setting me free. Thank you for giving your life just for me. How I thank you.
Jesus called disciples. He called them to follow him, to live with him, to be with him. So the call to discipleship really is first and foremost a call to follow Jesus. And then he called them to become a community. He said that the evidence that you're my disciples is you love each other. So discipleship is to come together, loving Christ, growing and learning about Christ, and loving and caring about each other. There is a high price to pay. He says you have to take your cross and follow me. You have to abandon your self-centeredness and become a part of the body and a part of the mission. Every day we're learning more of what it means to be followers of Christ. It's our worshiping congregations that encourage believers to grow in their relationship with each other, with their community, and with God. For this reason, we work to increase the size of our churches and plant new congregations in areas not yet served. In our seminaries, colleges, and universities, men and women are prepared for service in our communities and our churches. In the beginning of the Church of the Nazarene, there were two high priorities, evangelism and education because our founding fathers believed it was necessary to exploit those very impressionable years of young people, train them, prepare them, send them out into the world to be the, the power and presence of Jesus Christ. So from the beginning, that's been a high priority. There is the will of God about my life. Today in the Church of the Nazarene, we have 57 colleges, universities, and seminaries in 40 countries of the world. More than 30,000 young people involved in, uh, in the educational preparation for life and for ministry. Church of the Nazarene supports higher education at uh, a level of almost $24 million annually. So you can see that continues to be a high priority because we believe it is such a vital part of the mission of the church. On Sundays, a Nazarene church is a busy place. Children and seniors share the hallways. Adults find their classrooms with a Bible in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other. Our teenagers are, well, teenagers. We talk and sing and worship. The reason for all this activity is that we are committed to being and inviting others to become disciples of Christ. Our local churches provide that opportunity through Sunday school, Bible studies, worship, and small accountability groups. When we are together, we are the body of Christ assembled. We are trained and inspired and equipped for ministry. But when our building is empty, that is when we really do the work of the church, encountering the needs of people around us and demonstrating the hope of life in Christ. With our eyes, we see the need. With our ears, we hear the hurt. With our hands, we touch the distressed. This is what the body of Christ does. We are the body of Christ. I was new to the church, new to believing in Christ, and the um, pastor asked me if I would volunteer some time to just do a research project on women who had children with AIDS. And in 89, 88, it was all about men with AIDS in this city, and we couldn't find any services. So I started right out by giving classes and teaching people um, how to change diapers and what was true and was not true about transmission of AIDS. And um, that very quickly after in 89, I was assigned to a little boy who's three months old. I would go once or twice a week and just sit with him and hold him. When Susan came home and said, thank you for just giving me four hours to go to my group and talk to other women with AIDS, it was just the best feeling. And within months we talked about whether maybe I could be a foster parent or something like that. It was very dramatic. Um, as you might guess from me smiling, the story is that she's completely in remission and I just remember feeling so valuable and feeling that I was the hands of Christ there for just that moment and um, it was great to bring her to church with me and to be and say this is my friend you know I've traveled with this community for 13 years and it's a family that you know you can count on um, that I know that if I needed somebody to give me shelter to give me aid that they'd be there one by one as you come into this community 
that's what you get. You get that feeling of trust. You just feel like the hands of God are in each of the people in each of the seats. Because we are committed to God, we share his love for the lost and his compassion for the poor and broken. All people, being created in the image of God, have ultimate value. It is our mission to love and value these as they are loved and valued by God, who seeks to bring them peace, justice, and salvation from sin through Christ. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Well, the Great Commission is the ultimate mission statement. And it's global in nature, but it's also local in nature. Uh, it was Christ's will, his mandate for us, that we go right into our communities. So we have to have mission strategies. We have to see every church as a mission station, every member as a missionary, reaching out to give the good news of Jesus Christ and fulfilling the Great Commission everywhere. It has to be local, but then we understand the global implications. Right now in 138 countries of the world and, uh, and growing, looking for more open doors to enter, we are, going, we are committed to carrying out the Great Commission locally and globally. It's our job. We are all God has on this earth. Hi, Christy. Well, I'm taking your prayer request today. We are his hands, we are his feet, we are his eyes, we are his ears. He wants to use us to touch other people. He wants to answer prayer for your boys. You've got three boys. Yes. Okay. I go to these businesses and I just take their prayer requests. Basically, that's what it is. I just ask them if they have any needs within their business, any needs within, you know, their families that they need prayer for. Hey, I just wanted you to know we're praying for your business. Um, All right, I know there's a lot of competition in town, yeah. but we've been praying for you. God began to tell me, Ramonda, you need to go out and take prayer requests from people. And I said, God, what are you talking about? There's no way I can do that. He said, yes, you can. You can do it. I said, who, God? Who do you want me to take prayer requests from? What do you want me to do? And then he began to place on my heart relationships that were already established. And the very first place was Blue Springs Bouquet. Well, I was skeptical about the prayer request, but Ramonda's been a customer of mine for a long time. We had a couple of drivers, one had cancer, one had a heart, real bad heart problem, had a heart, heart attack, heart surgery, and they both came through with flying colors. She prayed for them every week. We always know on, on Friday she's going to call. Maybe they haven't thought about God in a long time. Maybe they've not given any consideration to Him. But you know, I believe this triggers something within their very spirit, that there is a God who loves them, that cares about them, that wants to to answer their prayers, that wants a relationship with them. Yes, you know I'm praying for you. Oh, really? Yes, I am. Oh. They have to know that I love them, and I think they know that. I do love them. And so when they see her come in, they know what she's here for, you know, so they, they start thinking about people they know and who they need to pray for, so I think it helps them, and they recognize her. Okay. I will do that. Thank you, ma'am. You're so welcome. And my daughter's going to come in here and show you those pictures. Okay? Oh, I'm so excited. All right. To see those. I know you are, and she'll bring those in. 
I just wish I could get this message out to the whole world. This is what being a Christian is all about. This is living out our Christianity outside of the church, going in and touching lives, letting them know that Jesus cares for them, that there's a God, there's a God up there who cares about them, who wants to answer their prayers, who loves them, who cares where they spend eternity. I am not qualified to be doing this because I haven't been to seminary, I don't have a degree, but I just have a, a, a passion within my heart to be obedient to what God wants me to do. I have a passion to make a difference for Him. We all have this opportunity right at our hands to do. We all have those types of relationships in our life. And it's not that difficult. Just say, hey, you know, do you need prayer for something? What's going on in your life? You know, what are you struggling with? Where are you hurting? Let me pray for you. That's who we are. That's who the Church of the Nazarene is.